Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, serve them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identify with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Dowson. Today our guest is Ellen Hodgson Brown. Ellen is the author of The Web of Debt, The Shocking Truth About Our Money System and How We Can Break Free. She's also the author of 11 other books. Uh, she has sold over 285,000 copies of her books. Uh, she is a practicing attorney in Los Angeles, and she's also the president of the Public Banking Institute. So, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, David. Good. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. So, in in my reading and preparing for this, I came across uh, a, a quote uh, talking about the American banking system as being a private cartel, uh, which has taken power to create money from us, the people, and privatized it. Would you just expand on that and tell us what you're talking about? Mm. <laughs> well, most people think money is created by the government, but that's not true. Money, money, uh, money, coins are created by the government, and that's it. The Constitution says Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof, and that's all Congress does, or actually the Treasury. And then um, dollar bills are created they're printed by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, but they're actually issued by the Federal Reserve. So they're the customer that buys them for six cents a bill from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and then gets the what's called the seniorage between the six cents and the hundred dollars or whatever the face amount of the bill is. So the Federal Reserve actually issues our dollars, but the Federal Reserve itself is composed of 12 branches, all of which are uh, privately owned by the banks in their districts. And the, um, the, the Fed and uh, coins and dollar bills together only make a small portion, make up a small portion of our money supply. So even with quantitative easing, which is accounting entry money created by the, the Fed, at most maybe 10% of the money supply is created. Uh, even calling the Fed a public institution, which you can argue about, they, they make only a small portion of the money supply. And all the rest is created by banks when they make loans. So they do it by something called fractional reserve lending or the money multiplier. So when you, you take out a mortgage, let's say, or you go to, loan, to the bank to get a loan, let's say it's for a $500,000 mortgage, the bank will write that on one side of its balance sheet as an asset to themselves because you're going to pay them over time with interest and then they write it on the other side of their balance sheet as a liability to themselves because they have to pay your seller when you write that $500,000 check to your seller. So that check is then going to go into another bank and um, 
it will become a deposit in another bank, which uh, is allowed to lend 90%, holding back 10% in reserve. And that might become a check that goes into another bank, which can lend 90% of that, et cetera, et cetera. So each time it becomes a new deposit account, it's counted in the money supply because that's the way they count the money supply. It's coins, dollar bills, checkbook money. Um, that's M1 and then M2 adds savings deposits and other forms of deposits that individuals use. And then M3 is the large institutional investors. So they, they create money by effectively double counting it. It's still a deposit, or the, the original depositor's money is still there at the same time that it's been lent out to somebody else, and that's how it's created. Okay. And, and for each dollar deposit that the, that, the, that the Federal Reserve receives, they can lend out 10 times that amount? Is that right? Uh, the Federal Reserve doesn't receive deposits. The, okay, you the, mean pr a the bank. private banks yeah. receive the money, okay, and I, then well, they can lend it out. That's actually the capital from each dollar of capital that they have, they can lend 10 times that sum. Um, it, it is kind of, there's a lot of confusion about this 10 to 1 thing with the, with the yeah. money. It's, it, it, over many banks, t many banks can lend 10 times the original deposit. But the ori if the original bank tried to lend 10 times its deposits, it would probably get in trouble when it tried to clear the checks because it, it it has to clear it through oh. the reserve account, and it's probably not going to have en enough on deposit, so it'll have to borrow from other places, and it might have trouble with the interest rate, et cetera. So they don't actually, they're, they're more likely to lend as much as they have on deposit. Okay. But when you multiply it over many banks, then you do get the 10 to 1 effect. Okay. And is that 10 to 1 effect mandated um, as a maximum by law, or is that just banking practice? That It's not even really a maximum, because if banks create more money than there are reserves for in the entire system, the Federal Reserve will create more. So, so the Federal Reserve is really there to backstop the whole banking system. It used to be that they didn't do that, of course, that gold was the reserve. What, what was kept on reserve was gold, and there was only a limited amount of gold. So in the 19th century, you had this waves of every six years, on average, there would be a banking crisis. And so that was why the Federal Reserve was set up, and one of the reasons it was set up in 1913, supposedly to backstop all these bank runs. Okay. T talk, talk a bit about the creation of the Federal Reserve itself. Um, it was said, I saw your clip on the populace, which is, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've showed that particularly for you, so. Uh, thanks, yeah, the, you know, my web of data is the theme is the populist movement of the 1890s and how that was reflected in the Wizard of Oz. Uh, the leader of the populist movement was um, William Jennings Bryan, and he lost the 1896 and 1900 elections, but then he went on to be the opposition in uh, Congress. So, so there was a bill brought by the Rockefeller Morgan cartel to, uh, called the Aldrich Bill. To the idea was to to uh, it was basically the Federal Reserve Act, but originally they called it the Aldrich Bill, and it was obvious that it was uh, big banks that were behind it. And so William Jennings Bryan um, said, absolutely not. There was no way that he would back a bill where the banks would be creating the money and lending it to us, you know, our money. He said it. he insisted that the government would have to um, uh, be the originator of the money. And so they changed the name to the Federal Reserve Act, and they obscurely worded it so that you couldn't really tell. I mean, even now, you can't really tell what it says. I'm a lawyer, and I've, uh -huh. I've read it, and there are parts where you just really have to puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are they talking about? So he thought that they had actually won. It was called the Federal Reserve Act. He said, at last, we, you know, the people will be issuing their own money. And so he endorsed it, and, and it got passed in 1913. Uh, and it was supposed to prevent bank runs, but obviously that didn't work because in 1929, from 29 to 33, we had the largest bank run that we've ever had. So. OK, all right. And, and, and is there a possibility? Well, let's talk about what's the downside for me 
of having the present banking system? Uh, the biggest thing is the interest, that banks create the principal but not the interest when they create loans. And so then they have to get the, we, the, the borrowers, have to find the interest somewhere and it's not out there. So we're all competing with each other to find this interest. So either you have to continually com expand the money supply or you continually have to have growth. You know, we're always pushing growth. Mm -hmm. But that's all to pay back this uh, system where we're rent basically renting money from people who didn't even have it when they created it. I mean, they just created it as accounting entries on their books. And we have to pay this tribute in the form of interest, which creates a sort of parasitic growth on the side of the economy. It doesn't get fed back in the economy, but they always, when they put $10 in in the form of loans, they want 11 out. You know, So they're always taking back more than they put in, and that whole capital account growing on the side of the economy is bleeding the economy dry. Um, there's a researcher in Germany who added up all the in Earth, she collated all this data, adding up all the interest that's paid by producers at every stage of production of, of a product, and she concluded that 35% of everything we buy goes to interest. So that's a huge chunk, a huge sum that's going to the bankers. So if we, there are two models of banking. One is the extractive model, and that's what we have today. And the other is the cooperative model, where you would feed those that 35% back into the economy, either in the form of if you have public banks, then the government will get the interest. They're the banker, so they get the interest. So, so that makes more money that they have to spend, or either they can cut taxes or they can increase services. Okay. So that 35% is like a sales tax that but we all huge, pay all the time. Yeah. It's huge tax. Yeah. Or if you look at mortgages, they can. You can be paying two or three times the size of your original principal in interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And so you spoke there about public banks. How do public banks work? Uh, a public bank is owned by the government. That's what it is, a government-owned, publicly-owned bank. So it could be a state-owned bank, a county-owned bank, a city-owned bank, or a nationally-owned bank. I'm writing now a sequel to Web of Debt, which is on public banking. Uh, globally and historically, and it's actually, we don't hear about it, but 40% of banks globally are publicly owned. Mm. And these are largely in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which have 40% of the global population. And they all escaped the credit crisis, the banking crisis, so. So you're talking about the 2008 yeah. Great Recession, mm -hmm. The, mm -hmm. right, okay. And, and so th they haven't been affected by that? Right. So and that we wasn't have quite as global as we thought. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we have one state that escaped, and that's North Dakota. They've had a nice surplus every year since 2008, and they are the only state ha that have their own state-owned bank. Okay. All right. And, and uh, tell us a little bit about the development of that bank in North Dakota. Why, why did that happen? Uh, that was the populist movement. I mean, it was the populist movement in North Dakota. And it, in the 1890s, after... Um, uh, William Jennings Bryan was defeated, the populist movement sort of died out nationally. But in North Dakota, they were losing their farms to the Wall Street bankers, and they figured out that the, the bankers and the railroad and the granary were a one long cartel, and the granaries weren't taking their grain, even though it was good grain. And so, so the farmers got together in the non or the nonpartisan league. So they were making it clear this was not a this was not a Republican or a Democrat issue. It was all about getting keeping our money local. So it's very much in keeping with our lead in uh, yeah. video. Yes. Right. Okay. So, right. so that's exactly what they were doing, uh -huh. was just keeping it here in the state. So the, the North Dakota Bank of North Dakota model is that all of the state's revenues are deposited by law into the Bank of North Dakota. So then it can do what all banks do, which is turn those deposits into loans. So they're they're creating credit for the state instead of giving those most most states put their revenues in Wall Street banks, and Wall Street banks are not lending them back to us. You know they've. Mm -hmm. They've, particularly since 2008, they've radically reduced um, their loans to local 
business and to local homeowners, et cetera. And instead, they're using that money to speculate, to get into derivatives, to interest rate swaps, credit default swaps, et cetera, things that actually hurt us. So by putting our revenues in our own bank, we can create credit where it needs to go. We can, first of all, we have control over where it goes, and second of all, the profits go back to the people. Okay. It, it, it's specific. I, I, I understand that the Bank of North Dakota has been very big in giving student loans. Is, is that the case? Yeah, well, that was true right up until recently. I, and they were, were a very good deal for the students, and it was a, it was a money maker for, for the Bank of North Dakota because these were fed, federally guaranteed loans. But you know, just recently, the Obama, the one it was it one of, one of the acts. I think it was the health care bill incorporated this provision where edu the education loans would be taken over by the education department. Oh right. So now they're federal. It took the bank middlemen out of the equation and lowered the lowered the cost for those loans. Theoretically, Theoretically. but I've heard that the federal the federal government is being just as strict with the students as as the banks were because they, the theory is that they're broke and they have to collect everywhere they can, but they're not broke. I mean, that's, that's what I've written about at length, that okay. we've been deluded into thinking that we don't have the money. Uh, right, yeah, and at the end of this conversation, I'll have a little blurb about We're Not Broke, a new oh, video that yeah. we'll be showing here in Portland, so we'll uh -huh. come back to that yeah, one. Great. Right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you said that 40% of the of the world's banking is actually already done in public banks. Mm -hmm. um, do they all do that? Are, are those banks all structured the same, or, or are they different no, models? No, there are or? many models, and that's what's so interesting. And there have been many models historically. The, my favorite, of course, we're be, we're a long way from doing that, but is Aust in Australia. From, 19, from 1912, when we set up our Federal Reserve, they also set up a public, public central bank, but it really was a public central bank. I mean, it was owned by the government, and they did what a central bank could do, a public national bank could do, which was just issue credit backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the people. Um, they, they had, had they had gone through a depression just like we had in the 1890s and they de in the early 1900s and they decided they the government needed to, to fix this you know needed to step in and, and be the, be the top of the banking system so the bankers were quite alarmed and they they made sure that one of their own people got in as the head but because he was a banker he knew how banking worked and he knew that banks just create credit on their books and he realized he could use this tool for the benefit of the people, and so that's what he did. They just issued credit for everything in sight, roadways, seaways, uh, anything good for the, for the country, and they funded uh, Australia's participation in World War I. But he made the mistake of going to London and bragging about it and saying anything the Australian people wanted, they could have, you know, whatever they could imagine they could have. and. Uh, he passed away rather suddenly thereafter of a heart uh, attack, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> and and they totally changed the system. I mean, the the city of London had kept control of their former colonies economically. The idea was they were supposed to be the lenders and they would be the source of revenues, and the idea that the colonies could discover that they could just create their own money and they didn't need to resort to the Bank of England was quite alarming. So, that, so they changed the system so that um, the, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia was the central bank at, and would issue the currency and lend it to the government instead of the government lending the currency. So that was the, the evolution of the central bank system that we have now. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. In New Zealand, they have a, they have a public bank. They, now they have a... a, 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 a was it uh, established because they were trying to get out from control of Australian banks? Yeah. Do I remember a story like that? Yeah, that's yeah. right. They, in 2002, they set up um, Kiwi Bank, which is a, a postal bank. You know, our post, post office is dying, and they're selling off these beautiful post offices that were built in the 1930s because supposedly they're broke. 
um, in New Zealand, they, they have postal, uh, post offices all through the country. So the, and the Australian banks, most of the, the Australian banks controlled the banking in, in, a, in New Zealand, and the profits were all going to Australia. And to maximize their profits, they had shut down all these local, local um, banks. And so the, the local people, the farmers, were having trouble doing banking at all. So the government decided to do this um, national system that would be in their post offices. You could just stand in line and do your banking and your, buy your uh, stamps at uh -huh. the same time. And they, all the critics said oh, this would never work, and, and, but it worked brilliantly well. The people just flooded over into the, the postal bank. Uh -huh. okay. We could do that. We could save our post office the same way. Yeah, and then I've heard some theories, some talk about creating land banks. Uh, talk about that. Okay. Yeah. There are land banks already, county-owned land banks that take over. In the United States? Yeah, Michigan oh. and other states that have, where they're really in crisis in their uh, neighborhoods where the blighted, foreclosed, abandoned properties are bringing down the property values. So the land bank goes in and takes these properties, usually on a tax lien. But then they have to find the money to fix them up, and they, they have different problems doing these land banks. But what you could do, um, some other counties, for example, San Bernardino County is working on a plan to take not just the blighted, foreclosed, abandoned properties, but the, the underwater properties that are still the the homeowners are still paying, but it's the underwater situation that has is just destroying San Bernardino County. The city just filed for bankruptcy, San oh. Bernardino City. Mm -hmm. So they're quite desperate to fix that problem. So they're looking at this model where they'll go in and take the underwater properties by eminent domain oh. and then just uh, sell them to, back to the homeowners at fair market value, and then they're working something out with that with the creditors. But what you could do, because there is all, all this uh, litigation now, that, uh, courts increasingly, and apparently in Oregon, that the rule is now that uh, MERS, the Mortgage Electronic Registration System, is this electronic database uh, in the name of which more than half of the properties in the country are now uh, recorded with the county recorder, that MERS cannot hold title and it can't convey title. That means nobody has title to these properties. They've broken the chain of title with this electronic database that's uh, concealing all the, you know, the investor trading of these uh, mortgage-backed securities, the uh -huh. chopping up of real estate into little bits. Right, yeah. So they could go in, take these properties by eminent domain, go in with a, um, a, a, a county bank that would put a notice in the paper and say, we're going, we're going to take these properties. Uh, anyone who can prove title will pay fair market value to. But the banks aren't going to be able to prove title. Mm -hmm. And so the county would get the properties for free. Uh, and then they could do some sort of fair workout. And the properties could be part of their capital base for a bank. Oh. And they could put their county revenues in the bank, turn it, create deposits out of their rev I mean create credit out of their their deposits like banks do so you know combining uh -huh. all these possibilities you could have a really strong bank that could do remarkable yeah. things for your neighborhood yeah well you've presented us with quite a lot to think about <laughs> and some exciting possibilities for for the future and I know that a number of states have introduced public proposals legislation for public banks. So we've only got about a minute. So can, can you talk about those just just for a second? Oh yeah, 20, 20 states have introduced bills of one sort or another for publicly owned banks. Um, I'm president of the Public Banking Institute and we've got all that on our website. There's a page that tells you what's going on in your state and gives the legislation. So our website is publicbankinginstitute.org and uh, my own website is webofdebt.com, and I have over 150 articles on this subject that I've written since 2008. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining Thanks. us. Thank you, David. All right. Great, great. So if, uh, if you want more information on this,
topic of our of the American financial system and public banking, uh, you can go to the publicbankinginstitute.org website. You can also go to Ellen's website, thewebofdebt.com, and she also has a blog, uh, webofdebt.wordpress.com. If you want more information on efforts in Oregon to create a state bank, you can go to Oregonians for a state bank org and if you want to learn how to stop supporting too big to fail banks and start supporting local banks and credit unions you can go to oregonbankslocal.org here in portland also we are as i mentioned earlier going to have a screening of we're not broke we're not broke well we know that but the powers that be don't seem to agree with us they say we're broke and we need to cut. We need to cut services, we need to cut Social Security, we need to cut Medicare, we need to cut teachers and firemen and so on. We need to sell off public assets, we need to privatize, we need to balance the budget. And all of you out there are the ones who are going to be made to pay for it. Meanwhile, multi-billion dollar American multinational corporations like Exxon, Bank of America, and Google are making record profits. These corporations and their wealthy CEOs are concealing colossal profits overseas to avoid paying American taxes. Please join the Alliance for Democracy for a screening of We're Not Broke. This is the story of how U.S. corporations have been able to hide over a trillion dollars from Uncle Sam and how seven fed up Americans from across the nation have taken to the streets and vowed to make corporations pay their fair share. Screening date is Friday, November 16th, starting at 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church at 12th and Southwest Salmon here in Portland. Doors open at 6.30. And for this one time showing, the director of We're Not Broke, Victoria Bruce, will be there for a discussion following the video. Never miss an episode of Populous Dialogues again. Populous Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populous Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. I want to thank our crew today for being here. Roger Bates, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And I want to thank the audience for watching again. And we hope that we'll see you again next week. So long.